Hello, hello. Megan Thompson here with Megan Thompson Coaching. And I wanted to get in here. I know that I had said that I would go live in the Facebook group. And so I just want to share this to, uh, to the group as we get started. So I wanted to talk to you guys tonight about why I'm certain that if you're parenting a highly sensitive child, you are already on the same page with your spouse or co-parent. One thing that I think is super important when, um, when we're dealing with parents of highly sensitive kids is I hear from a fair amount of you that you're struggling. Hi, Paula, good to see you. <laughs> um, a fair amount of you are struggling with wondering whether or not you'll ever be on the same page with your spouse. And so when you think about the, the fact that traditional parenting strategies don't work for parenting highly sensitive children, it's obviously super crucial that when you do make changes to change the way that you're responding to your child, you are consistent, right? Because that's one of the, the crucial pieces in terms of turning around the, the intense emotions that your child is experiencing, decreasing the intensity of their emotions that they're experiencing. And then also, obviously, if you're following me, ending the meltdown cycle, right? And so if that's the intensity that you're looking to fix, I want to discuss some of the uh, mindset blocks, some of the shifts that you need to make as a parent, some of the uh, perspectives that you're holding that are keeping you stuck. So one of the things that I know is crucial in parenting a highly sensitive child is that the change has to come from you as a parent. For your child to break that meltdown cycle, if they are having outbursts, yelling, kicking, screaming, threatening to harm themselves, wanting to die, saying they'd be better off, life would be better off without you or without them, uh, or hitting siblings, et cetera, you see aggression. Or on the other side of things, your child is running away, uh, either outside, you know, where, where you can't um, monitor or watch them or keep them safe, or even, you know, working with children, we've seen them hide under their beds and, and, and refuse to come out or some way, shape, or form of, of that. So running away from their experiencing experiences or exploding in their experiences. And when that's happening on a daily basis, you're fried. We already know that, right? So as a parent, it's super crucial for if you're in a two-parent household, for both of you to be doing the same thing. And if you're not on the same page, you need to be able to respond in an appropriate way that holds the same ideas and ideals that your child needs to be able to communicate their emotions verbally and non-verbally on a developmental level. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that you as a parent need to be the one who's teaching your child how to communicate their emotions. So you've heard me say this and we're not gonna dive into this today because it's a, you know, a training for a different day. But highly sensitive children change their relationship to the world and their ability to communicate their needs without big emotions through their relationship with their parents. So when you're looking at how to shift your child's behavior and how to help your child manage their emotions in a safe way, you are the catalyst as a parent. And so one thing that we see frequently when, when parents are either posting in the Facebook group or just on, on the conversations that we have with parents and across both businesses, whether that be in the private practice or, or here in the coaching business, is that one spouse will hold the myth in their heart that their spouse is not on the same page with them and that keeps you stuck. And so I wanna break down five lies that you're telling yourselves today that keeps you in this position of not solving the problem. And this is super important because when we think about where these lies come from, and you know, over my decades plus experience in coaching and, and supporting parents and breaking out of this intensity, it took a lot of work for me to not buy into my clients' stories, <laughs> right? Because of, you know, trained as a therapist, um, we're taught to believe the client and meet the client where they're at. And so this did a really huge disservice for me in my work with parents of highly sensitive children. And so it's something that I actually had to train myself out of. Uh, because if you're looking to break them out on cycle, then you need somebody who can help you see outside, see the forest for the trees, right? You need to be able to have somebody see the big picture and lead you out of that. 
because when you're stuck in the moment, you have a lot of stories that you're telling yourself about your your experiences that are that are keeping you in that position. A lot of beliefs about yourself, your child, etc., and they are true to you, and they are also not keeping you. Um, towards the goal that you want, right? So I've, I've said this before and and um, it's not often the focus of, of these lives because the perspective shifting is only just one tiny piece of the work that you need to do uh, to, to change this. You also need the practical strategies, right? It's not just like, you know, think about it differently and, and the meltdowns disappear. Um, you need action, obviously. But we're gonna talk about the thinking about it differently today. So let's break down myth number one okay so before i get there what i want to do is is just capitalize on why this is so important um and and it it stems personally from from just from the understanding that as a a therapist a parenting expert and um an expert in in parenting highly sensitive children it's also true that i am married and a parent and uh, my husband is not that expert (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so I experienced what you guys are experiencing, experienced in, in, in the sense that I needed to train myself to believe the same thing about my husband that I believed about my clients and their spouses. And uh, that's a different skill set than it is, you know, being able to believe it for, for the people that you can, you know, see outside of yourself. So that's one of the reasons why I think it's crucial for you, because um, it's not just a matter of knowing it on a professional level, but also experiencing it on a personal level and being able to make that work for my family. Um, Because I have to be able to relate to my husband as a wife, not as a parent coach, right? (laughs) That doesn't work. I can't be his therapist. I can't be his coach. So um, he needs to be able to follow I want to say follow direction, but that's not really the right word. follow my support and follow my influence in helping him reach the same goals that he wants to reach for our daughter. And in order to do that, I need to be able to be persuasive but not convincing. Um, and and that requires a skill set that is different than, you know, people who are, who are coming to me with the understanding that I know what I'm doing with, with children who are not my own. Um, you know, there's a different dynamic because as uh, any of you who are in a couple <laughs> um, or who are out of a couple but still co-parenting, you know for damn sure that if you're the one telling your spouse or, or, or co-parent what to do, um, they don't take it well, usually. There's a lot of finesse in, in a healthy relationship where um, you can't be telling, you have to be working together. So we're going to break down those myths because this is what's keeping you stuck. And uh, if you are interested and or in need of seeking professional support, it could be the very reason why you guys haven't been able to successfully move towards that as a as a couple in, in your parenting journey. Um, because if you're if you're buying into these stories that you're telling yourself, um, then your child suffers, you suffer, and the whole family dynamic and the ripple effect that that of that of impact. Um, that that creates is uh, is impacted. Um, I just use the same word in, in the sentence twice. Guys, I told you that I would go live tonight and I'm sticking to my word even though it is almost 10 o'clock um, <laughs> Eastern time. So we are we are doing what we can here, right? All right, so myth number one, your partner is certain that their way works. Okay, so Let's talk about what this means. If you believe that your partner will just, you know, take partner, spouse, etc. cetera. Um, if you believe that your partner is 100% certain that what they're doing is going to solve the problem, then you are going to keep yourself stuck. Because if your partner is a human, then they second guess themselves. All right, so we all know human, um, well, we don't always know human behavior, but I can tell you as an expert of human behavior that it is common for a person who is stuck circling the drain of an intense emotion and circling the drain of a behavior pattern that they can't get out of, that they are absolutely second guessing themselves, okay? 
And so if you believe that your your spouse, say for example, you know, they, they believe that taking away privileges and, and getting rid of the um, the tablet and you know, grounding your child and sending them to their room is like the way that has to work and it's the only way that your child will learn to change their behavior and yet your child's behavior is not changing, then you bet for damn sure that your spouse is second guessing themselves, okay? Now, I am speaking to all of you who are not in abusive relationships or working as we discussed yesterday with somebody who is completely antisocial, all right? Because that's a totally different ball game and, and we might address that later tonight. But for those of you in generally healthy relationships who are struggling with this issue and that's compounding how healthy your relationship is, you better tune in because this is really, really important. So. Your partner knows, here's the truth, your partner knows what they're doing isn't working. And when you hold that belief and you believe that and you find evidence for that, then it's a heck of a lot easier for you to remember, not believe, I'm not convincing you, remember that nobody wants to be miserable, right? Nobody wants to be miserable. Nobody was put on this earth to be miserable. Just like your child, highly sensitive, experiencing big emotions on a daily basis is miserable, your child doesn't want that. And so near, neither does your spouse, neither do you. And that's why you're trying to get out of it. And so when you remember that, then it's very easy to remember that a lot of adults can quote Einstein, that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results, okay? And so when you remember that part, then you can have conversations with your partner this is addressing myth number one, that they're stuck and they know it. And you guys need to come together to get out of it, okay? So your partner wants to live a life that's free of misery, just like everybody else in your family does. Nobody was born, nobody was put on this earth to be miserable, and nobody wants to stay miserable, okay? So that's number one. Number two, the second myth that's keeping you stuck in this meltdown cycle is that your spouse has to do their own research in order to change the dynamic in your household. Now, here's the truth. Because your spouse trusts you to do the research, your spouse also trusts you to do, to do the research to vet the professional that you're working with. Now, if you are at the point where you need to work with a professional and I have to tell you that if you are dealing with daily meltdowns, that is not something you're gonna be able to pull yourself out of on your own because your child is in experiencing intense emotions. You need support to do that. Um, then it's super important to understand that if your spouse is expecting you to care for your child, right? to know the rules about whether or not to give them Tylenol, to know the rules about when they should get a Band-Aid and when they should go to the doctor to get a suture, to know the rules about when they should uh, call the doctor for a fever or when a, you know, a sniffly nose can send them to school, you know, COVID, COVID irrelevant, right? <laughs> um, then your spouse is trusting you to understand when typical child development is not being demonstrated by your child's behavior. And they trust you to be doing the research. And so that doesn't mean that they need to repeat the work that you've done. How many of you have gone into a car dealership, right? Where you trust your spouse to do most of the research, but you guys go together and you show up and you you, you sit in the car and you're like, yeah, the seats are comfy. I um, you know I can see out the out of the rearview mirror. The drive is smooth. I trust my spouse. They picked a safe car, right? How many of you have gone to um, you know gone to to shop for a house and and one of your your you know your spouse or your co-parent? has done the majority of the communication with the realtor, and then you guys go together to visit the houses, right? So the background research, post you know, ideas in the chat if something else is coming up to you. How many of you have gone to the, you know, looked up the pediatrician, talked to your neighbors about doctors that in the area that would make sense, or looked them up on Google and said, our kid's going to this doctor, it's the, it's the best in the, um, it's the best in, in our, our area or you know 
uh, came recommended by our good friend whom we trust and has similar values. Um, your spouse trusts you to do the research and your spouse trusts you to give them the highlights enough for them to believe that you're on the money in managing this behavior. And when, when we speak about changing the dynamic in your household and helping your children or your child who's highly sensitive break out of the meltdown cycle, if you're the one doing most of the research, that doesn't mean that your spouse doesn't trust you and needs to do their own. It means that part, the communication needs to be clear from you and it, needs, it means that they need to be given the opportunity to have a conversation with you about what you're learning without you having, um, without you jumping to conclusions that they would, they don't wanna hear it or that their fear, we'll talk about that in a minute, is gonna shut the conversation down in the first place, okay? So I wanna talk about these because some of these myths compound upon the next, all right? So you, you don't need to be your spouse's educator, right? Teacher, professor, therapist, coach, in order to help your spouse understand that your child has needs that are different than the other 80% of the population. And that's super important because if you are like most of the families that come to us before they get to us, you're probably Googling till one in the morning, right? Um, you're reading every parenting book under the sun. I had one client say she could build a fort with the amount of books that she's read in parenting um, before we started to work together. And the, you know, not to mention the fact that about 70% of the people that we work with are medical professionals, um, whether that be or in the helping field. So, you know, doctors, nurses, therapists, um, and teachers, professors. So the majority of the, those of you who are watching are well-researched, well-read, and understand child development in a way that people who don't value parenting don't, right? And so when your spouse, if you're in a two-parent household, hasn't done all of the research, hasn't read the exact books that you've read, hasn't read the books that you've read, it doesn't mean that they don't value the research that you've done. It means that you guys are balancing family life in a way that works for your family. One of you has been delegated to be the researcher, whether that was self-delegated or you know, an actual, actual conversation, it's neither here nor there. And so that's really crucial because when we think about the concept of parenting and the understanding of the research and, and, and communicating the fact that highly sensitive children need to change through their relationship with their parent, your spouse does not need to come to their own conclusion by reading all of the things that you've read in order to trust you that you've read all the things and have come to that conclusion, all right? So they just need to trust you and you need to decide that you've made it, you've done enough research for them to trust you and have a conversation about where their questions are so you can answer them. So myth, myth number three, okay? Your spouse doesn't trust you to make a decision about when it's time to work with a professional. So when we think about you know myth number two it was what kind of professional or or, or what needs to be done or, or what sort of approach right what sort of parenting approach what sort of um, method to follow to to break the break the meltdown cycle that's a different level of research another level of research is when you've said enough is enough i need help okay so i'm going to just speak from a woman's perspective um, because that's who i am <laughs> Um, as a wife, my husband does not get to decide when I go to the doctor. My husband does not get to decide my doctor. And he does not get to decide whether or not I'm too sick to go to the doctor. Um, I let him know I'm going, right? And if he needs to arrange childcare, uh, we talk about it. I don't just demand that he be home. I say, you know, I need this. We got to do this together and, and balance our different roles. But I can tell you for certain that if we needed support for our daughter, I'm, I might be the one doing the bulk of the research and I'm gonna be one the, the one making the call. 
And when that's the case, if I am the one making the call, I don't need to convince my husband that he has to get on board and believe me or concur with my decision that it's time to work with a professional. He just needs to trust me that I'm done and fried and I need to communicate effectively to tell him that so that I'm not yelling at him or making him feel like, and I mean yelling, not necessarily in the actual sense, but in the communication sense. Hey, I understand that this is hard for us to talk about and I have to let you know, I have met my threshold. We have to change and I don't know what else to do. I have met my limit. And a conversation though firm, without a heightened level of emotion, can be much more powerful with your co-partner, with your co-parent or your spouse than having these conversations only in arguments because we see this often. And so I wanted to speak about this because your spouse trusts you to take action to, to save the safety of your child. They don't need to come up to their, to come to their own conclusion that it's time for you to run in front of a car if your, if your kid is running away in that moment, right? You don't need to ask your, your spouse or your co-parent permission to chase after your kid if they are having an intense emotion and an explosion at that or a meltdown and they're running right in front of the car. Hey, honey, I think it's time for me to, to start jumping. Like, what do you think? You're not asking that question. You're going and you're saying, catch up, okay? So when, when we think about when you've hit your limit as a spouse, as, you know, in a two-parent household, when, when you have a co-parent and you've hit your limit, I gotta ask you, why are you waiting for your spouse to catch up before you act? Why aren't you saying, hey, look, I've been running, I'm tired, I need a hand. This isn't working, we need support. And using that language, we. Because if your efforts are required to parent your child more so than your spouse, say for example, they're working out of the home or you're both working but the you know gender roles are, are in play here, who knows? Um, then you're feeling depleted and if they're not rising to match that, then you need outside help. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's no shame in that, especially for parenting highly sensitive kids. And so when it's time, it's important to understand how your spouse or co-parent needs to hear that from you, not that they don't believe you when you say it, okay? So when they trust you to choose that it's time to take your kid to the doctor if their fever has gone beyond i'm gonna i'm not gonna quote feverous behavior gone beyond the number that the doctor says <laughs> like my mom's a nurse i i just call her <laughs> what do i do um so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say whatever it is a hundred and something um i could be mis you know i could be wrong i just call my mom every time my kid has a fever which is thankfully very rare but anyways your spouse does not Cat does not, um, I lost my train of thought. Your spouse, do, you don't need to ask your spouse's permission to call the doctor, right? So why do you need to ask your spouse's permission to get support in changing the dynamic when your child is, is suffering emotionally? Especially if your child is managing that, those emotions through explosions, through feeling out of control, through feeling completely ineffective in their own home by saying that their you know, life would be better off without them or they better off dead or they're stupid and they knew it and they'd never get out of here or they'll never amount to anything or you know, you'd be better off without me or I was a mistake. This is things that we ha hear from our clients all the time, guys. It's not new information. I'm not saying this to, you know, th for shock value. This, these are verbatim words out of the parents' mouths that we work with. And knowing that when, if your child was feverous or had spots all over their body, <laughs> would you say, hi, honey, like, I'm, I think it's time for me to call the doctor. No, oh, you'd be like, I called the doctor. We have an appointment. They need to, you know, they need to hear from both of us. They need to check our, I don't know, 
genetic history or whatever because there's something ano- anomalous going on. And so you say you got to show up to the appointment, right? So that just is what it is. Hey, Lindsay, good to see you. So when we think about the parenting system, and if that system, you know, in two parent household is not 50 50, it is, which is rare, very rare these days. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, is in time, time commitment. Um, not necessarily an emotional commitment. This whole training today is on the fact that you guys are 100-100 on emotional commitment in parenting your child. It is not supposed to balance each other out. You have to remember that you guys were 100-100 in choosing to have kids. And so you're 100-100% tra- changing the, the, the lives of your child. And so when you believe that and remember that of your spouse, then it's a heck of a lot easier to say, hey, look, like this is, a, this is important to you and we need to change it now because it's time. You know, our child has had too much. Our child has had a fever for too long. It's time for us to take, to, take them to the hospital. So when you think about changing the dynamic in your household and knowing for certain that you need to make a drastic change in the way that you parent, it is crucial to stand firm in that decision of yours. And firm does not mean to stand in anger because anger does not demonstrate power, it demonstrates vulnerability. And when your spouse or co-parent sees that you are vulnerable in that moment, they are not going to believe you that you're making a sound decision. Because especially, you know, as you know, when you're, when you're trying to help your child and, and reassure them out of fear, it's difficult when they are saying in, in fear that um, that they want you know that they want to stop school or they want to quit soccer or whatever because it's it's too much. I'm not saying whatever to dismiss their need. I'm, I'm trying to get to my point here. So when your child is responding in fear and they're screaming it and yelling it and and in that fight or flight response, forcefully saying we you know we're sending an ultimatum. If you don't do this, then I'm just going to die. That intense forcefulness can't be the same way that you communicate your needs to your your spouse or co-parent that you need to solve the problem because otherwise they're they're not going to listen, right? They're going to feel like their back's up against a wall. So if you have a conversation and say, hey, look, this is where we've been, you know, the last three, four months, the last three, four years, our child has felt out of control in her emotions and... I've been listening to this expert team here at this point for a while now, or even just recently, and they're telling me that this is not normal and I believe them and I'm done. And so we need to fix this problem. This is a problem that needs to be fixed now, not later. And when you have a conversation like that, you can allow your spouse to have a conversation rather than be you know, talked at. So, this is hard to do when we're when it comes to our kids, right? Like when we're in mama bear mode, I'm just going to speak for myself. Um, it's really hard to speak articulately and um, and not repeat yourself or talk over somebody, right? And so it's hard to have a, a two-way conversation. So you need to broach the subject when you are calm, cool, collected, and you've gathered your thoughts. Because if you haven't done that, then your spouse is not going to trust that you are at your limit. They're going to trust that you're at your limit that day. That's a big difference than being at your limit in general. Okay, And so that's going to be super crucial for for changing the dynamic in your household for your child. Because when you have a a collected conversation, your, your child will benefit more. And then when... I, w- I want to look at this from, from an understanding of, of priorities and balanced priorities in the family. Every family has multiple priorities, right? Health, wealth, wellness, uh, spirituality, um, emotional health, and um, stability, right? Safety, all of those things. I'm not, I, I didn't number them. And so in a two-parent household, you have the luxury of being able to split 
some of those, not necessarily 50-50, right? It's all in and all in. You guys are both all in together to, to manage those priorities. And what that means is that there's delegation going on. And so if you are the CEO of parenting in your household, then your spouse trusts you to be the CEO of parenting in your household. And they, they trust you to make decisions, executive decisions about solving the problem. And they trust you when you present that decision and say, this is what we're doing. Uh, I want to, you know, get your, your input um, and have a conversation about it, but we're, you know, we're going to be doing this and I want to make sure that, that you're on board with it. And so when we think about whether or not, you know, you chose to have your kid go to in-person school or virtual school or, um, you know, find, as we mentioned earlier, find a doctor, um, get a tutor for your kid, all of those things, making life decisions, have your kid go to three sports or two, especially being highly sensitive, all sorts of ways that you've been navigating, you know, have hang out with this kid who's struggling with his big emotions or not, stay with these friends or not, um, go on this vacation or not. Your spouse is noticing that not every decision is made together. You guys are not um, the, the wheels on the same axle. Okay, you're different parts of the engine moving at the same pace in the same parallel, um, in the same way, right? But you're not in whatever that word is. I'm going to move into a car metaphor, and that's a really bad choice for me in my my life. <laughs> you're not mimicking each other, right? Like you don't have to. You can pivot, and you can you can work together. So. I'm speaking in these broad ter terms because anybody who's in in a healthy relationship or a lasting relationship in, in a two-parent household knows for certain that you guys don't make all of your decisions together in sync because <laughs> you would be paralyzed with your decision-making process. Like nothing would get done, right? So. What it means is that if child rearing and its responsibility was primarily delegated to you, likely because you're watching this video, um, unless you're you know watching this on the replay and you're and you're playing it for your spouse or with your spouse to have a great conversation, then it's important to understand that your spouse trusts you to do that, and so you need to believe that, because if they didn't trust you then you wouldn't be making decisions, would you? So your partner has been watching you carry the weight of this intensity for a very long time. And they have been caring about you as you carry this weight for a very long time. And they trust you to tell you when the weight is too heavy to bear. I think of that that um, atlas, right? The the statue. Parenting a highly sensitive child. I, I know all about it in the sense that um, you know, growing up with my sister being highly sensitive, my mom lived on the edge of fried for a long while um, growing up hairpin trigger just by nature of struggling to support three kids right so that in and of itself is hard and one who needed more of her than the other two but all children need you as a parent right so um you know i only have one kid and she is on the um you know less intense side of the the highly sensitive spectrum um and you know, in terms of the fact that she's very perceptive and bright and, and, and curious and, and um, compassionate and notices the emotions of others. Um, but her emotional regulation is, um, is in check. And so when we think about, and, and that's taxing, that's hard. It's hard to parent, but it's not impossible. It's not devastating. It's not tiring. It's not exhausting. It's not frustrating on a daily basis. It's not woeful. And it doesn't fry you 
unless you're stuck in the meltdown cycle. And the meltdown cycle looks like daily or multiple times a day or even every other day, living on, walking on eggshells, living on glass, right? Not knowing when the other shoe is gonna drop. You're holding your breath, you're wondering what's going on, you're waking up with dread or going to sleep with guilt or both. And that is an internal experience that your spouse needs to trust you and does trust you to tell them when you've had enough. So if you did choose, and I, I mentioned spouse, but this is partner, co-parent, et cetera. You guys chose all in, 100 to 100 to have a kid, 100 100 to stay together, 100%, 100%. This is not a 50-50 game, guys. And um, if that's feeling confusing, I've got a great relationship coach. <laughs> <laughs> reach out to me. She helped me make that distinction in my relationship with my husband a while ago. Um, but when you when you remember that you're both all in, then you can remember that when you were both all in, you both committed to tell each other when you've had enough and you need help. And that doesn't mean that you both have to be at that level in order to get the help. It means that you need to have an open, honest, and lovingly firm conversation with your partner and say, I can't do it anymore at this, in this level, at this level, right? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So let's move on to myth, myth number, th number four because I spent a, a, a fair amount of time talking about number three. Number four, huge, okay? Your partner isn't as committed because they often refuse to try new things. <laughs> um, Lindsay says, I like how you explain things make sense. Glad to help you with this. Absolutely, I'm glad. Um, so here's the deal. Um, change is hard. Change is hard unless you've hit your limit, right? Now, if you're numb to living in the daily cycle of meltdowns day in, day out for months, years on end, then you've hit a, a baseline of chaos in your mind, in your body, in your soul, in your household, in your environment, and for your child that feels normal to you. And so when we think about getting you out of that, because you're two different people, you guys have a different understanding of how much normal you can take and where your breaking points are, right? But when you said, I do, or when you said, yes, let's move in together, or when, when you said, I want to have a kid with you, or I want you to help me raise my child and raise the, my child together, um, or however you decided you know, you know, to, to co-parent, you made a decision and a commitment to that relationship to communicate your needs in a healthy way. And your spouse trusts you to do that. And so when, when you don't do that and hold off, then you betray that trust and that breaks the relationship. And your spouse is expecting you to let them know when it's enough is enough. So when it's, um, when it's gotten to that point and enough is enough, and they say, oh, you know, I don't really think enough is enough. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't mean that they don't believe you. It means that new things are hard and change is hard. And the only thing that's constant in life is change. So it's up to you to say, I know, and we still need to do it. Okay. So two things are true at the same time. Your spouse is having a hard time with change because there are a fair amount of people in the world who fear change. And you still need to fix the problem because your child is suffering, especially if they're threatening their lives or if they're at the point where they're saying, I hate you, you don't love me because threatening their lives is the next step along the line, guys. I've been doing this for way too long to sugarcoat it with you or to pretend that that's not where you're headed. So you can't, when your child, excuse me, when your spouse, <laughs> <laughs> that was not a Freudian slip. Might be. Um, 
when your spouse or co-parent says, no, no, can't do it. I don't know. I, I can't do it. You know, we, you know, now's not the right time. It's important to not decide that those words from your spouse are meaning that they don't want the change that you're looking for, that they don't want to break out of this intense emotion that your child is experiencing, that they don't want to stop watching your child suffer on a daily basis, and that they don't want to stop suffering either. Some people are just afraid to make changes because they're afraid they're, they'll fail, and they need you to remember who they are the beautiful person that you fell in love with or were in love with at some point in order to co-parent them, co-parent with them. And remember that they can do hard things. And especially if the two of you are working together, you can do hard things. Because two people can can create a, a beautiful partnership when you are working towards the end goal, which as you already know, having chosen to have kids, is something that you both believe, right? That you would create a beautiful life for your child. That's how you envision it. Nobody, nobody signs up, you know, stamp, I'm gonna have a kid. However, that happens for your family and says like, and that kid's gonna have a miserable life and it just is what it is. No, you dream, you hope, you plan, you expect joy. You don't expect perfection, but you expect joy on a daily basis. And when you see those glimmers of joy escape your child's face and be replaced by misery and doubt and fear and worry and concern and sadness and outbursts and yelling and curse words at eight, nine, 10, 11 years old, that's your sign, guys, that your future is here and it's not planning, working out the way you planned. And so you got to take action on that because nobody else can change that but you. But you. And so what you do is you remember in that moment that your spouse or co-parent is absolutely committed even if it's hard for them to do things at first because maybe they're just afraid to fail maybe stretching outside their comfort zone is difficult. Maybe they're highly sensitive. <laughs> and if you have a child who's highly sensitive, then they need to lead first. And maybe they just need to be reminded that they are a leader in their own home as well. Because that's another thing they saw about in themselves and having children, right? I know that I can lead my child to developing a high quality character and an, and an effective personality that, that becomes successful in whatever they want to do so that I can have children, raise them, and then play with my grandchildren and not also raise my grandchildren or play with my grandchildren and not also house my, my child, right? So you have an end point to, within which the, your child need ha- needs to have skills in order to be self-sufficient. And so that success might look different for any child. But when we're thinking about highly sensitive children, you need your child to be emotionally independent so that they can then be financially independent, academically independent, and interpersonally independent so that they're not needing you to solve their problems and while holding down a great job still are living in your basement. So that's super crucial and that's not something that you just magically like expect and and hope for when your kid hits 16, right? When you're like, oh snap, my kid's got two years to figure this stuff out one year before they start applying to college, if that's, you know, one of your dreams for your kid that you want to create for them if if they, um, if that's what they want for themselves. And so now's the time to observe, hey, look, we're, here's where we're headed, but this is where we wanted to go. So I know that this is hard for us to have a conversation. I've hit my limit, as we discussed in myth number four, and I know you're committed to solve this problem because you chose to have kids and you chose to parent and you chose to you know, help us weigh the, and, and um, uphold all of our priorities in our, in our household. 
And so that means that you delegated some of that to me. And so here's me using my delegation card because I've been spending more time in that area of expertise in our household as the CEO. And so whether it's necessary to change, whether or not your spouse is capable of change, and whether or not it is comfortable for them to change are three very different things. So if your child, if your spouse is not comfortable, I don't often give relationship co-parenting advice in this, so I would say child. (laughs) If your spouse or co-parent is not comfortable in making changes, that does not mean that it is not necessary and that they don't need your support in, in remembering that and making that decision and making it now. Because when you notice that your child, and you are certain that your child needs that intense change in their lives to break out of the intensity of their emotion, then you need to remember that when you're having that certainty of, I know this is hard for you, and I can still help you find comfort in that and figure we'll figure this out. So you can't do that with your panic pants on. <laughs> you can't. If you're panicking, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you know, my, my spouse, my co-parent doesn't believe that this is a problem. They, you know, they, they say, no, we don't need to fix it. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. My husband does this <laughs> whenever I look. Whenever I say something that's a little, uh, I'm blowing things out of proportion, he goes, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, (laughs) like runs around the house like a chicken with its head cut off. Makes. I married him for his sense of humor, and it's also true that some of the time his sense of humor (laughs) doesn't always land the way I want it to land in that moment. Because at that point, I'm mad, I'm frustrated. I want him to listen to me being frustrated, right? No. He's going to do the opposite of that so that I chill the freak out, right? Because that's why you married your spouse or that's why you're together, right? Because you balance each other out. When one is freaking out, the other one is holding steady, finding levity, looking with things in perspective. So don't shrink in that moment. Oh, you're right. You know what? I haven't been, you know, like don't shrink in that moment. Don't become Gollum from Lord of the Rings. Yes, master. No, say, hey, I know you're going to have a little freak out. We'll talk about it in the morning. (laughs) Maybe your timing was inappropriate. (laughs) Been there, done that, right? But it doesn't mean that you table it for two months. It doesn't mean that you scowl and you research and you keep Googling trying to figure it out on your own. It doesn't mean that you forget about it. It means you put it on a reminder on your phone and you have the conversation again tomorrow and the next day, and the next day, and until your spouse or partner says, okay, this is obviously very serious. You don't need to, you know, torch the place in your house emotionally. (laughs) Obviously, I'm not saying you're gonna go, you know, light a fire to your own house. Your kid's already on fire with their intense emotions. Your spouse or co-parent sees this. They see it, right? And so when this is happening, It's important for you to notice that and then hold steady that your spouse or co-parent will also remember that. Remember that. That you are the one whom they have trusted to make these decisions and to help them act on them doesn't mean they do the work, doesn't mean you script, you know, talking for them, doesn't mean that you are taking away all parenting rights or all parenting input, but it means that if they've delegated major decisions about your child's health, wealth, and we, health and emotional health and, and well-being and to you, then now's the time for you to make that decision and say, honey, we've been having these conversations. We haven't been able to fix it. Now's the time. I know this is hard and we can still do it and it's necessary. You can't do that acting like the sky is falling, whatever that guy is, chicken little. I think that's the right word. 
So the right story. Ask them if they're open for feedback in that moment. If they're yelling, obviously, they're mad, right, at, their chi at your child. Um, now it's not the time to be like, honey, are you open for feedback on your approach, <laughs> right? You would definitely want to separate your, your spouse or co-parent from your child in that moment or give them a look or an eye to get them to, to notice what they're doing is ineffective. And then give them a moment to cool down and say, it sounds like you were really frustrated. You wanted to solve the problem. It didn't work. Are you open to some feedback on that? Because what I notice is that we're both doing things that has us spinning our wheels. Now here's where you are in sync. You're on a hamster wheel, stuck. And you don't know how to get off of it because you're both on the hamster wheel. Maybe on two different hamster wheels, but you're both still stuck. And so it's up to you to look outside of where you're at and notice that and say, it's time for us to take the lead take, to get off of this and to, and to solve the problem and ask for help. Because parenting highly sensitive children is hard, but it doesn't have to be excruciating. And having that conversation about whether or not your spouse is open to another perspective is super important because if you're not asking permission for them to hear you out, then you're telling and you're teaching. And as a result, you're convincing and nobody likes to be told what to do. <laughs> Spoken from a true type A redhead over here. Like, don't you tell me what to do. <laughs> I didn't like the way things were going. I, run, I started to run two businesses. I, you know, you know what I mean? Like the, so I know all about not being liked, not being, not liking being told what to do. And, um, and so when that's the case, right, the same is in your relationship. So demanding it, giving ultimatums, only bringing up your struggles when frustrated is not a fair communication strategy to then fairly assess whether or not your spouse or co-parent is committed to hearing you that you've hit your limit and committed to fix the problem. Because if that's the only way that you're communicating that there's a problem that needs to be fixed, then they are not gonna be able to hear you because they're in defensive mode. So that's really important. All right, so bonus, myth number five, guys. And um, this one's a little inflammatory, if you will. My partner is selfish or too busy. They won't do the work. Now, what I often hear, I wouldn't say often, what I sometimes hear from parents is, um, my spouse is too busy. But what does that mean? That means that you are calling your spouse or partner selfish. And when I say that to you, what was your response? No, they're not. Okay, then here's where we're getting real, right? Because if you're jumping to the conclusion that your spouse is selfish or too busy, what does that really mean? What that means is that you're stuck in helping them remember that they have different priorities and, and they need to manage all of them at the same time, right? You guys have the same priorities, but there are multiple priorities, raising your children, keeping a roof over your head, holding down a job, feeling um, like you can contribute to society in every, in whatever way, having variety and spice in your life, having, you know, con connection to the community as well as to your relationships. All of those things are what every human needs. And so if your spouse is focused on one or the other and they're busy, it doesn't mean that they're deprioritizing one over the other. And and if you're making that mean that, then you're calling your spouse selfish. And I know for certain that the majority of you would get defensive if somebody called your spouse selfish, <laughs> even if it is your parent, <laughs> right? Like the mother-in-law languaging, <laughs> right? Or your best friend. Uh, you, you don't want to hear that, right? Because you know it's not true. So you support your kid managing their own emotions every day. And when you do that, you don't have a crappy day every single day, right? So even if your spouse is selfish, which I don't believe, you, 
then if they were selfish, they would selfishly not want to have crappy days every day. And they would selfishly want to fix the problem because then they wouldn't feel like shit on a daily basis. So either way, you got a bonus because you can solve the problem even if you believe that your spouse doesn't want to do all the heavy lifting in changing this dynamic. You both need to be on the same page. And when we, you know, particularly from my perspective, when we help our clients, we make that easy. It is, it is hard work in the sense that there's a lot to do, but we take the guessing out of it. So um, we hear a lot of, uh, of parents in two-parent households um, who, who benefit from scripts and drag-and-drop conversations with their children that, that are repeated and systematic and they work. And so when that happens, it's a heck of a lot easier for you to take the weight off of telling your spouse what to do. And it's a heck of a lot easier than hearing or wondering, like, should we say it like this? Or how do we drop the news about our kid about this? Or, or how do I make sure my kid feels proud about this but doesn't you know, have too much pressure about that, right? There's certain systematic ways to do that, right? So if, you're, if, you're, if your spouse is busy, then all the more reason to find a solution that fixes the problem quickly, right? Rather than dragging this out for like two, three years, as most parents will report to you, that's how long therapy takes to maybe sort of break the cycle. Sometimes not though. You know, the majority of the families that we work with at this point, if they're, they're going to therapy with therapists who don't know what they're doing with this population, it can take several years and then they're still stuck. Right? Or they're recommending ther uh, medication, psychiatric care, or a higher level of care. Um, and that's when the parents are like, no, you know, I thought you were supposed to help me solve the problem, not make the problem worse by adding additional factors and throwing more things at the wall to see what sticks. I was doing that three years ago when I found you. But when, and, and you guys can look at the research yourself or, or find other uh, trainings I have in here and in, in, in the group um, about why changing the dynamic from a parenting perspective is much more effective than changing the dynamic from another outside person um, and, and trying to address your child in individual therapy, et cetera. That's, that's not effective, and the research stands by that. Um, and so when, um, when we speak about that, what we're talking about is being able to turn around not just the way that you see your spouse, right? Because having arguments about parenting is a symptom of the meltdown cycle. We see marriages improve over and over and over again with our clients because it is a symptom of the real problem, which is not being able to, to, to break the cycle of the meltdowns. Um, so if you're having this conundrum, second guessing your spouse's um, intention, second guessing whether or not you guys are on the same page, um, not realizing, as we addressed in myth, myth one, that your spouse is also lost and confused and second-guessing themselves, then you're in it. You're literally experiencing a, just another symptom and side effect of the meltdown cycle, and you don't even know it. There are way too many factors in, at play here for us to you know, nail it all down in an hour-long training. Um, and, and that just is, is, um, is what it is. And so, you know, we do what we can with all these with all these videos for you and all the training. And then, obviously, um, you know, truly solving the problem requires a heck of a lot more work than that. So, if that's something that you're interested in, if you're ready to solve the problem and you know that you need help to do it, then I encourage you to book a call. Right? Get on the phone with us. Speak to the, our team about whether or not we can help you solve the problem. And if we can't, we'll tell you. What you need to do instead because the bottom line is we can't help everybody we only work with people who are totally committed to solve the problem who know that they need to value parenting their child and changing the dynamic in their household in a way that is research-backed and they're not ready or willing to make it harder than it needs to be but also they know that they want to be the ones in control of their own their own household, but also are ready to do the work, right? This is a lot of work to, to do. And so if all of those factors are a yes, and your child is experiencing intense emotions in a way that demonstrates they're highly sensitive and they're in a meltdown cycle, 
then we say that we can work with you. But we don't know that till we get on the phone, right? Because it's super important for us to make sure that you have the direction where to go. And it makes no difference to us whether or not you work with us because we help plenty of people. But it's super important that we know, you know, where you need to go next. And you can't do that on some, you know, commenting chatter on a Facebook page. It's just not not enough. So that's why we do the call. It's free, right? So MeganThompsonCoaching.com backslash talk. If we can help you, we'll tell you how that works. If we can't, then we will steer you in the right direction. I would encourage you, if you're in this spot, make sure you watch the master class. Make sure you play this video with your spouse again. Give each other a hug, right? Understand that you're in this together. Remember that and get on the phone and we'll see if we can help you fix it and get you out of this heck of a mess. All right. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Have a good night. Bye.